Take your Bibles, if you would, and uh, turn to the book of Matthew. Take a look up on the screen there. This is someone, we use this term, straddling the fence. Someone straddling the fence. Always in life, there's going to be times and things when we are uncertain about something. And we don't know exactly what to do. Uh, maybe you've got a job, but you're working, and maybe somebody comes along and offers you a different job. You don't know if it's necessarily better or not, but it's different, definitely different. And so we would say that right now you're on the fence about whether or not you're going to keep the job you have or take the one that's being offered to you. And you're just uncertain. You just don't know what to do. Uh, sometimes uh, we have decisions, maybe you're contemplating uh, matrimony and um, you're thinking about choosing someone to be with and someone that will, uh, somebody that you can make miserable for the rest of their life, no, um, somebody that you're going to be with and I, I believe marriage ought to last, Amen. I believe it ought to last, and that, that, what that means is you pick a mate wisely. Do it wisely. Do it with God's wisdom. But we can be on the fence about who we're going to be hooked up with, who we're going to marry, who we're going to go with. Uh, that could be a decision. Uh, that really never was a hard decision for me. I didn't have that many people that were just beating down my door to yeah, call me their own. I'm glad I found my wife, amen? She felt sorry for me is what she did. She still does. But anyway, um, so you can, you can be deciding about that. Maybe, maybe there's a new house. And you're deciding whether or not you want to sell the old house live in it, or, and live in the new one or stay in the old house and just bypass the new one. Now, those are decisions that uh, we're on the fence about maybe you go to the restaurant and you're looking at the menu and you're on the fence about three or four different things you want to eat just order them all and take it home <laughs> amen do what yeah but then and I, I, I understand it I understand this because I've done it before. You're straddling the fence of who's going to be your master in life. Whether you're going to serve God and live for God or you're going to serve the spirit of this world, the prince of the power of the air, you're going to live for the devil. Now, all of those other decisions that I gave you, maybe you're, like I say, maybe you're going to take another job or keep the one you've got, or maybe you're going to move to another house, keep the house you got, or maybe you're going to uh, find somebody to mate up with and get married to for the rest of your life, or you just take somebody else. All of those decisions... Yeah, it's understandable to uh, sit on the fence about it, to straddle the fence, to not be sure, as this character on the screen uh, uh, sort of epitomizes, the finger to the mouth means we're thinking about something and we're not sure about it. But when it comes to whether you're going to serve God or you're going to serve the devil, that should not even be a decision. That ought to be one of those things that, well, that's easy. I need to serve God. I need to get on God's side of the fence. And let me, let me tell you something. You're in Matthew. I want you to turn to Matthew 25. I didn't plan on starting there, but I'm there already. That means the sermon's almost over with. Out. You go out and sit with Roy and keep him awake.
I am going to try to expedite this. I do need to get on the road. They start earlier than what I thought, 6 o'clock, and i got to get down there in plenty of time to set everything up. If you look at Matthew chapter 25, this is one of those things that if you don't, if you don't decide now, it's going to be decided for you. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from the other, or from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And if you look at verse, um, 20, verse 45, this is of the goats. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of these, one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Again, if you will not decide, it will be decided for you. And you may not like how it turns out. In fact, I'll just say this. You want to straddle the fence all your life? You're a goat. You're a goat. You will be separated out as a goat. You will be treated as a goat. You will be sent away into everlasting punishment. Don't let anybody online tell you that hell doesn't last forever. Don't anybody tell you that. That you, oh, you're annihilated, you're burned up in hell, and you don't know anything. And somebody, somebody made that up to soothe their own conscience. To give them a license to live however they want to live, thinking that hell's not going to be all that bad, and they can get away with it. I'm here to tell you, the Bible says it's punishment everlasting. And that's to those who either decide the wrong side or won't decide. It will be decided for you. Now turn to Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19. Here's, what I, here's the gist of everything I'm going to say to you today. Living for Christ is not like going to a buffet. You do not get to pick and choose which part of God's word you like, what part of God's word you're not going to pay attention to, and you're not going to live by it. I know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not preaching, my, I'm not exalting myself while debasing you. I, you guys know I never do that. I'm included right along with you on everything that I say. But you can't just decide you're going to live for God half of the time, and live for the devil, live for the world, and live for yourself the rest of the time. It's either all in or not in. It's never halfway, partway, three-quarter way, two-thirds way, it's never that way with God. God said, I am a jealous God. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Period. Gave no exceptions, gave no exclusions or inclusions. He simply said, live for me or you don't. But you don't do it halfway. Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. How many of you ever had something stolen from you? I, I mentioned uh, online the other day, talking about Brother Sterling, how he built, his, he built that house that they lived in, and had it almost all ready to move in, Lo and behold, somebody got in there 
and stole just about everything that they could detach and go away with. Stole the stove, the microwave, all kinds of stuff. Stole it right out of that house. So they had to go back and buy that all over again. Boy, that made him mad. Sterling did not like a thief. And I don't either. So whatever you decide to lay up on this earth, you're going to lose one way or the other. You're going to lose it all when you die. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Did you know that while, while you may say, uh, no one has the right to judge me, did you know that we do make it easy for people to see whether or not we really are Christians or not? We make it easy for them to see it. Because whatever is in our heart always comes out. It always shows up. Generally, what's in your heart come out your mouth. Amen? I mean, if you love somebody and you really love them, it'll come out of your mouth. Oh, I love you. And if you don't like somebody, you can hide it for a while. It'll eventually come out. Whatever is in your heart, you just make it easy for people to know who you really are. You're not fooling people. Where the treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. You know, I always say, you know, you look somebody in the eye. Or we tell our children when they've lied to us, look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. The light of the body is the eye. And therefore, thine eye be single, which means you got two eyes, but they're seeing the same thing. One thing they're seeing. Then the, uh, thy whole body sh uh, shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now I had to look that word up. That is an old word that basically means money. And it means wealth, increase, profit, gain. What is it that Paul said? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul said, I've learned to live without things. The people that we feed. You, you, Americans are like this. Americans have everything. We have food, we have everything. We, we throw things away. And you'll, the average American is all the time looking for happiness. Oh, I just don't find no happiness. Oh, I don't, I don't, I, it's just, oh, I can't find it, I can't find it. But with the people that we feed out in Kenya, some of the happiest people I ever met. Dirt, poor, don't have nothing but a goat. And they're probably going to have to eat the goat to stay alive. But they're happy people. That was manifested to me every time we feed them. Because, you know, they all, they're starving to death. But when we give out food, they all line up single file, one at a time. They don't rush. They don't try to take more than what belongs to them. We've never had that problem in all the years we've been feeding people out there. Never at one time had that problem. America, if we were giving stuff away, you'd always find somebody or some people that always want to cheat and go back and get in line again. Or rush it and take more than what they should. That's how most people are that are in America. We have things but we never have enough you cannot serve God you cannot serve the desires of this world at the same time you cannot serve God and you cannot serve the devil at the same time 
You cannot serve God and you cannot serve the desires of your flesh at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. If you're going to be crucified on the cross, then get ready to lose everything. That's the price to pay for the cross. Father, I ask your blessings now as I preach this message. Father, I pray, Lord, that I would not be in the flesh. God, that I would say the things, Lord, you want me to say, say things that are right and pleasing to you. But, Father, let these people see in me that I love them. I'm not preaching down my nose to them. I'm preaching to me as well because I'm guilty of this just like everybody else is. Father, remind us, God, that when it comes to you, there is no fence to straddle. It's either on, you're either, we're either on your side or we're not. And Father, maybe somebody, maybe somebody online, maybe somebody here, somebody down the road that's going to listen to this. Maybe they just need some help and encouragement and a reminder that when it comes to you, it's either we're either all in or we're not in. Help us, Father, to make that decision, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. I've mentioned to you before, I grew up in this church. Been here all my life, with the exception of three years in Bible college and three years pastoring a little church out in Richwoods, Missouri. The rest of the time, since I was seven years old, or eight years old, I've been right here in this building. Been in this pulpit since 1996. And I, I'm telling you, I grew up. Now, I, I don't want you to get the idea that everybody that I grew up under was a big, big fat hypocrite, and they're all a bunch of liars and everything like that. There were some godly people that went to this church. I think of some of them. I think Brother, Brother Dale McCurry. One of the best men I think I've ever met as far as a godly man. He was a deacon here, good piano player, good singer, and he was just a very humble man. He loved the Lord, and he didn't listen. When he got a big dose of God, he didn't mind shouting, Woo! Amen. It's wake people up in the house of God. But he, he was just as good as anybody I think I've ever met. Brother Warren Livingston was another one like that. Just a good man. We had some good preachers along the way. And so I don't want you to think that everybody here was just a big hypocrite. But we had some here. And these are people that were my Sunday school teachers. Or they were my youth leaders. Or they were uh, ones that worked uh, in various positions in the church. The piano players. They were, some of them were on the board, the trustee board. Some of them were deacons. Uh, maybe one or two of them was the preacher. And I did, I looked up to these people. I thought these were godly people, they're saints. They, uh, they're going to love the Lord and they're going to serve this church. And every time I come into these walls and come inside these doors, they're going to be here. I just know they're going to be here. Well, now that I've all grown up and I've seen how some of these people have turned out, I'm here to tell you that they were in here and they were in with us, but they were not of us. For they went out. And they didn't just go out and find another church to go to. They went out and just left. One man I can think of was my Sunday school teacher. And uh, served in this church. He'd helped take up the offering. And I just saw one Sunday, I saw a change in him. I, did, I wasn't expecting it. Next thing I know, he wasn't in church. Come to find out that he went back to drinking. Went back to chasing women. And as far as I know, if he's still alive, he's still doing it. And if he's died, he died, as far as I know, in that condition. Another man, a man that my daddy was friends with, they used to go rabbit hunting all the time, was in this church, uh, served in this church, did things in this church, name was on the membership rolls. He fell out of church, his family fell out with him. After a while, his wife and Children decided they're going back to church. They started to come back to church. They didn't bring him with him. He didn't come. One Sunday morning, we were told this. One Sunday morning, his daughter was walking down the hallway. She saw her daddy get up out of bed, go to the closet, get his suit out, laid it on the bed, stood there over it looking at it. 
He's on the fence. Picked the suit up, put it back in the closet, laid down in bed like he went to sleep. Not too long after that, he left a bar down in DeSoto, driving down 110 Highway, a foggy night, slammed his car up against the embankment. Part of him ended up in the back seat. Died just like that. Boom. Gone. He was of us, or he was with us, but he was not of us. He was playing church, playing it well. Young people that I grew up with, one young lady, a child in this church, grew up for the most part in this church. Then the family moved. She uh, was, still kept going to church, her and her sister, it's funny that when the family moved, the mama and daddy quit coming to church. And so now, this same young lady I'm talking about, she's a pastor of a liberal church and had the rainbow colors on her Facebook page. That ought to tell you something. Several of the young people that I grew up with, not in church to this day. I'm not bragging on myself because I know I followed after them long enough to where it's the grace of God that I'm still here. But I'll just tell you this. When the decision came to me, and God said, Mike, you cannot serve both. Which is it? I'm glad that I chose the right side. One lady, she was a member here. They moved. She got away from going to church at was looking at her Facebook page here a while back. She got her grandson confirmed in the Methodist church and was so proud of him for doing that. Now, I didn't say saved. I said confirmed. There's a difference. In that church, all you got to do is memorize some answers to some questions, say the right sayings, and uh, then when they ask you the questions, you give the right answers. They sprinkle you and say, you're going to heaven now. That ain't it. That's never it. I don't care if you got baptized here. That ain't it. It is a decision that you make for life. And it becomes your life outside of the walls of this place. It becomes your life. And I know there's always a list of things that we've got to yield over to God. God will bring us to those places in time and start taking stuff away. Very seldom does he just clean somebody up all at once. It's always one thing. It's always the cycles, one thing after another. But I've seen men. I, I, I rem I've told this story before. I remember one man. That I, I, he didn't go to this church, but I knew he went to another one. God-fearing church, Bible-believing church, served on a committee in that church. And I remember, I knew who he was. He didn't know who I was, but I knew who he was. And I remember I was out on visitation one night, and I was pulled in the gas station. was going to get me one of them big red sodas. I used to like them things. Now it's just too much sugar. I can't handle it. But I got my big red soda, and he was in line ahead of me with his pack of Bud Lights. And I just, I just followed him up the line. I knew who he was. And I just shook my head. I'm going, man, I thought this guy was really something. God will let somebody see it, won't he? It's hard when you're a goat to pretend to be a sheep for very long. You can't, you can't carry it on forever. At some point, 
you're going to make a decision or it'll be made for you. Turn, 1 Samuel chapter 15, turn there if you haven't already. This is Saul. When God told David to go find Saul, pour oil over his head, anoint him to be the king over all the people of Israel, the Bible says that Saul, when, when Samuel did that to him, he was, found himself a, a group of prophets. And the Bible says that the Spirit got in Saul and he started prophesying. He started preaching with the prophets of God. And it was said, is Saul among the prophets of God? They were saying that about Saul. They said, man, look at, what, look at what God has done in his life. Boy, that's a big change. But if you read through the text, you start seeing the downfall of Saul. It's coming. At some point, he starts thinking more of himself and less about God. And the, the hypocrisy and the blasphemy shows up eventually to where it shows up here in 1 Samuel 15. It is explained to us by Samuel what was expected of Saul. Saul heard, now you have to understand, the prophets, and give you, give you some little reading advice. When you're reading the Old Testament stories, like in 1 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Chronicles, so on, so on, when you read these stories, anytime you see the prophet of God, that's your Bible. They're speaking, thus saith the Lord, and they're giving you the word of the Lord. Well, that's what this book is. So Samuel is the Bible. And the Bible goes to Saul and tells Saul something specific that he wants him to do. There's no misunderstanding it. So if I say, thou shalt not steal... And as the offering plate went by you this morning, you slipped that $5 out of there and stuck it in your pocket. Is that stealing? See how easy that is? Thou shalt not steal. Lip. Now, I've never tried that. But I probably hung with some guys that did. You don't steal out of the offering plate. Amen? And you don't make change either. Well, all I got this hundred dollar bill. Can I get change? No. Put it in there and like, let God give you five hundred back. Amen. But if the Bible says do this, then you, when you don't do it, you know you're doing wrong. See, that's the thing I was, I was getting at. There's, you can straddle the fence about what house to buy or what to order at McDonald's. What you can't straddle the fence on is knowing whether you should serve God or not. That's easy. You're all here in church this morning because you know you've got to be serving God. And this is not an Elks meeting. It's not an AA meeting. This is the house of God. This is His service. And you're all here because you know it's better to serve God than it is serve the devil. And we all want to go to heaven. So it's not, that really, it's not really that hard a decision to make. There should be no straddling the fence. And yet there always is. There always is. So here's the instructions that the Bible told Saul to do. In verse 18, the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Now see how easy that is? Kill them all. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? You stole everything. God told you to leave everything there, but you took it. That's stealing. And he's verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Come on. God said, thou shalt not steal. You stole. You don't say, God told me to take that. God wanted me to take it. God said, thou shalt not bear false witness. 
and you lied. Well, it wasn't really a lie. Well, come on. You've known since you were six years old what a lie is. You know what the truth is. You're playing games, and God's not wearing a jersey. He's not playing games. This is eternal life or eternal damnation to you. But here Saul is trying to justify what he did and saying, but I did obey God. You sound like, you sound like, a, you sound like I sounded when I was seven years old, but I did. I was just trying to get out of a beating. Did you do your homework, son? Yeah, I did my homework. I didn't do it. So I knew I was lying. And I knew I didn't do the homework. So, verse 20 again, Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Did God tell you to bring back Agag? No. Then why did you bring back Agag? God told you to kill him. Well, you know, I, I brought him back so I could show everybody that, that I got him. But the people, verse 21, now Saul's blaming somebody else. But the people took of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice. Oh, we're going to, say, we're going to give them to Jesus. That's what we're going to do. Do us a favor in this church. Don't steal money that doesn't belong to you and then bring a tithe of it into the storehouse. Don't curse this church along with you. We don't want no part of it whatsoever. I don't care if it's a million dollars. I don't want it. But that's the stuff Saul's coming up with now. He's making up lies and excuses to, to justify his own doings. And that's what we do. We justify ourselves. I'm here to tell you that it's better if you let God justify you. That's the doctrine called the doctrine of the justification of sinners. Where God takes a sinner who has done wrong, they repent to God. God gives them godly sorrow. God may chasten them, but they turn their heart toward God. And God says to them, I see no sin. That's what you want. Because what you cover up, you'll always have to keep it covered up. That's what Achan did when he stole that stuff out of Ai. He hid, he hid it in under his tent. Did he not realize he was going to have to keep it hid for the rest of his life? Why then did you even steal it? Samuel, verse 22, said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What religion did Saul turn to at the end of his life? Witchcraft. Isn't that something? This Bible's right. This Bible's right. And see, here's what will happen. And this, the lady that I was talking about a while ago, she left this church and quit going to church for a long time. But then her daughter, I guess, started going to a Methodist church. And so she started going and she encouraged her grandson to get confirmed in the Methodist religion. It's not salvation. It never will be salvation. It's not being born again. He did a bunch of things that he was told to do, and he now believes that his doings, his works, got him eternal life. And she consented to it. Uh, there's still hope, I believe, but it's as if God turned them over to this. And there's something, people, you do not want to happen. 
and that is for God to turn you over to a reprobate mind. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. See what I told you? This Sam, uh, Samuel's the Bible. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee from being king. Now I want to introduce to you to a man by the name of Demas. Demas is listed in Colossians chapter 4 in what Paul said in verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, he's sending out, he's telling them, tell these people that I said hello. Or they're coming from me and they're bringing this letter. Or they're here with me and they're sending along their greetings to you. So Luke is with him, Luke the beloved physician, and this is the one that wrote the gospel of Luke. And Demas, greet you. Now greet, Paul is saying, Demas is with me. And he is serving the Lord along with Luke, and he greets you, the people of the Colossian church. And he says it again in Philemon, verse 23. There, there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. And Epaphras was a good guy. He really was. He remained faithful. He was a good, obedient servant. Paul mentioned him a, a, several times. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. We have Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, which is Luke. My fellow laborers. Look at how Paul is saying that they're helping me spread the gospel. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. But then, the last letter that Paul writes on this earth is 2 Timothy. Something happened between Colossians, Philemon, and 2 Timothy. Something happened to Demas. The world happened. The world happened. And so Paul said in 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Cretans also to Galatia. Titus unto Dalmatia. That's where the have Dalmatian dogs come from. Only Luke is with me. Look at that. Titus left me, Christians left me, Demas left me. Only Luke remains. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. This is why I say all the time, let's pray for these children. The law of averages will tell us or some other kind of law, that by and large, the children that are in this church at this present time, many of them will not be here 20 years from now. Why? Well, us as adults know what they're headed into, don't we? And all of us know how easy it is for a 20-year-old girl, a 20-year-old man, to just dive into the pleasures of this world and yield themselves over to it. And it'll be a grace miracle from God if God lets them come back. That's why it's important to instill that foundation in them at this young age so they know that they can come back like the prodigal son. He knew daddy would let him back. My question to all of us today is, are you that certain that God's going to let you back? Are you that sure? But Demas loved the world. And in 1 John, John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, are not of God. 
So you cannot love this world and the things that are in this world and love God at the same time. You're trying to serve two masters. You're trying to serve two masters, and you can't do it. You pick one and serve it. Jesus told the Laodicean church, I worry that you were hot or cold, but because you, you know what lukewarm is? It's the mixture of you're serving two masters. Jesus said, pick one, hot or cold. Pick one, however you want your bath, pick it. But don't think you can mix them and that be okay. I'll spew you out of my mouth. We have Elijah. On the day that he withstood the prophets of Baal in bringing down the fire from God to consume the sacrifice, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. You know what? They still wanted to sit on the fence. Now God showed himself that day for sure. But my question is to you, how many times does God have to show you what the right thing to do is? I know for a fact from the Bible and from life experience that at some point God quits telling you what the right decision is. And that is a place you don't want to be. Because at that point, the decision's already been made. Then, in Matthew 10, turn there and I'm going to be done. Look at there. You can tell I'm ready to get on the road. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor Mike, what about the times we got to get on the road? <laughs> Matthew chapter 10. I know this, this may sound contrary to what you've been told. The Bible tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. The Bible tells us to do unto others as we would have them do unto you. <laughs> I love my wife, I love my daughters, my sons, my grandchildren, I love my mother, my sisters, I love all my family, I love my mother-in-law, I love my father-in-law, I love all their family. But I'm not going to hell for any of them. Matthew 10, verse 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. You should have seen me when I was in high school and I decided that I was going to let people know that I was a Christian. Which meant that when I sat down with my buddies for lunch, after band practice, Jerry, that I got my food, and I sat at my table, and I said a little prayer. I didn't make a big deal of it. I didn't tell everybody they had to bow their heads. But you know what happened with my friends? When I sat down to pray, they all got quiet. And I prayed, and then I got done, and then we all cut up and did it, told our jokes and laughed and stuck food underneath the table so the, the janitor would find it later. <laughs> yeah, we did that. Now, we had a good time. But they didn't, they didn't mock me. They didn't make fun of me. They just got quiet until I got done, and then they, and we all had a good time and ate. Your school, young people, cannot tell you that you cannot live for God. And if they do, you call me, and I'll be, I'll be down there. 
with a camera and a live stream. I will. I won't put up with it for a minute. You have constitutionally guaranteed rights as teenagers and young people in school to pray, to read your Bible, to live out your Christianity. If everybody else can live out their weird lifestyle, you can live out yours. Verse 34, now, think not that I come in to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Isn't it something that your own family curses you and denies you and pokes fun at you because you're going to church on Sunday. Oh, we're having a, we're having a, and if, listen, if you let your family do this, they'll, every time they want to have a family get together, now Sunday morning we're all getting together. You know why they do that? They know they can pull you out of church. Don't let them do it. Well, if y'all getting together Sunday morning, y'all have a good time. Why don't you come to church with me and then we'll get together. He said, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. See, the cross is where we nailed our sins, not live them out. He's not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Thus saith the Lord. I don't have to add anything to that, do I? It's plain and simple. Now, will you be like Saul? Who, when he done wrong and was confronted with his sins with the word of the Lord... Saul lied about it, denied it, tried to say that he did do what God told him to do. In fact, he was honoring God more than God, God even, I, I honored God more than God wanted me to. And Saul died by his own hand, took his own life, having turned over to witchcraft because God said, I'm not talking to him no more. Or would you be like David? David did a pretty bad thing. He took Uriah the Hittite, who was in the list of David's mighty men. And he took his wife while Uriah was out fighting David's battles for him. He took Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, called her in to the palace lay with her, gave her a child to cover up the pregnancy. He called Uriah the Hittite from the battle, said, go home, be with your wife for a few days. And then you're doing so well, Uriah, David lied through his face to him. Uriah, go home to your wife. But Uriah was such a man, he said, not while my buddies are out fighting and spilling their blood. I'm not going to go home and be comforted. So he slept on David's porch. So to cover that up, David sent word saying, put Uriah out on the very front of the battle so that he'd be killed. And he murdered Uriah the Hittite to cover it up. Then he took Bathsheba in to be her, uh, her husband to cover up his sin. He committed one sin, then had to commit half a dozen others, but he thought he had it covered. He thought, nobody else will know this. I'll get away with it. When Nathan the prophet confronted him, he said, David, thou art the man. Upon hearing that he had been found out, David confessed his sins and repented. And Nathan said, thou art forgiven. 
It's your choice. You either live for God, and when you goof up, go back to God, let God forgive you, let God bless you, but let God tell you what you did wrong, or think that you can serve two masters, but you can't. And one day, the decision will be made for you whose side you're on. Let's bow our heads. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm not going to ask you to come down and confess any sins to me. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to open up these altars. For you to come to lay them down and leave them. And decide whose side you're going to be on. Will you do that while we...